Good morning. My name is Bill Neighbors. I'm president of the San Angelo Chamber of Commerce, and on behalf of the committee that puts on the West Texas Legislative Summit, we'd like to again welcome you to San Angelo and the McNeese Convention Center and the 11th Annual West Texas Legislative Summit hosted by the Chamber and really made possible by all of you, the volunteers and the attendees and the sponsors, and we appreciate your being here very much. We have an excellent attendance this year of local and area business people, energy representatives from across the state, along with local and statewide elected officials. So thank you for taking time to be with us uh, to look at this important issue and all of its ramifications in our region. Our thanks again to our sponsors and hosts for the opening reception last night and for the dinner at Fort Concho. We appreciate all of you who were able to be here and attend. As all of you know, the West Texas Legislative Summit seeks to examine issues that are really impacting our region in a variety of ways. And we like to explore opportunities and solutions that make all of our lives better. The Summit Steering Committee and the Energy Expo Planning Committee have done an outstanding job this year of really doing both of those things, along with the Chamber's very dedicated staff. So I hope that you'll thank the Planning Committee and the Chamber staff as you see them throughout the conference because they've done an excellent job this year. As always, uh, two of our elected officials representing this region, Congressman Mike Conaway participating as our special guest, and his staff members, along with our co-host, State Representative Drew Darby and his staff have done their usual outstanding job. Cheryl and all of you, thank you so much. And I hope you'll thank them as well. As well as all of the elected officials. Yes, thank you, Jamie. We appreciate your being here. And then, of course, uh, we met a number of our uh, statewide elected officials and local as well last night, and we'll have more of those coming in today. It is my great pleasure to turn the podium over to someone who has dreamed and conceptualized this two-day conference for most of the past year, uh, and he is the San Angelo Chambers Government Affairs Council Chairman, Jim Hughes. Please welcome him. Thank you, Phil, and thank all of you for attending our conference this year. We came up with the idea over a year ago that the timing was exactly right to talk about energy and how it affects us legislatively and in West Texas in our business world and all of our communities. And I think that whatever your occupation, whether you come from a, a county or a city or whether you are actually a member of this, in this area, we think that you'll, you'll find some uh, uh, information here in the next couple of days that you will, that you will be uh, happy to have. <clears throat> you received a binder this morning when you checked in. It's got uh, the agenda for the day, uh, today and tomorrow, and uh, speaker information, bios, all of those things are there. We would really like to thank the San Angelo Standard Times for this San Angelo Energy Expo magazine. There's a lot of information in there. All Slick Page and Jeff Deloach and his crew did an excellent job, and as well as those that, that helped uh, make the contacts. And uh, I think you'll enjoy that. Uh, take it home with you, but uh, it, uh, it will give you, it'll keep you up to date on what's going on now. Thanks again, Jeff, and the Standard Times. We're also grateful to have 17 companies that are helping to sponsor the summit and five sponsors of the <coughs> Energy Expo this year. You've seen their information on the screen and you will continue to see it around. However, during the course of the day, I'm going to be mentioning uh, some of these people and we do have a deep appreciation for what they've done to help put on this program. I'd like to, right now I'm going to <coughs> acknowledge a few of them. Appreciation to AEP Texas, and I see Fred Hernandez out here, Aqua Services, AT&T, KIDY Fox TV, San Angelo Association of Realtors, Penny, thank you for your support, 
Shannon Medical Center, San Angelo Standard Times again. Southern Link Communications and the <clears throat> Texas Monthly uh, Community Network. They are very active in our whole area and we appreciate each of you and we'll get some more. At this time, I'm going to like to take the pleasure to introduce Drew Darby. Drew Darby is not uh, someone that most of you don't know, but uh, he is uh, uh, very important in this in this program. He's uh, been involved in it now for several years and has kind of spearheaded the the uh, summit and brought it to where it is. Uh, <clears throat> Drew represents nine counties of of uh, West Texas, including uh, areas of the Concho Valley and the Permian Basin. His area is larger than seven states. More important, by the way, than those seven states. But uh, Drew is a product of San Angelo Schools, and he received his uh, degree, his bachelor's in, uh, in business, and a <clears throat> Juris uh, Doctorate from the University of Texas, and he's also gone to the Darden School for Emerging Leaders at the University of Virginia. Drew was elected to the House in 06 and has done a powerful job, we feel, because he has served on some of the strongest committees. The Committee on Appropriations in every session since his election. We think that's great and he has done a, a good job. He's serving as currently as the Chairman of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Natural Resources, Business, Economic Development, and regulatory agency. The chairman of the House Redistricting Committee, member of the Higher Education Committee, was recently appointed by Speaker Strauss to serve as a member of the Legislative Budget Board. As a businessman, Drew is the president of, founder of Darby Law Firm and owner of Darby, of, of, um, Darby Title, and they're doing business under the name of Surety Title, which has offices in several uh, West Texas cities. He and Clarissa have a wonderful family and they're a real, a real asset to not only to San Angelo but to all of West Texas. He's a friend and I welcome him to get this program going. Thank you, Drew. Looks like a, a Baptist church, everybody in the back. Come on, everybody move up front. Welcome this morning, bright day in West Texas, nothing better than being uh, here in, in the most vibrant part of our state, one that's uh, the most important part of our state from my perspective, certainly from a, a budget standpoint and the viability of our economy in the state, this is the lifeblood of our economy out here in West Texas. Welcome to all of you. My job this morning is, is just kind of, number one, introduce some of the elected representatives that are that are here today and I will start I'll start with uh, recognizing my staff uh, I promise you we're only as good as our staff and I've got the greatest staff in the capital I promise you uh, Cheryl De Cordova my district director here in San Angelo Cheryl wave your hand Kate Retz my legislative director and Jason Michael my chief of staff uh, welcome to you um, representative elect Dwayne Burns and Joy Davis Dwayne, why don't you stand up? One, one, of, the, one of the advantages of a, of a meeting like this is we're able to not only listen to hopefully good and interesting and informative topics, but uh, to network. And so as I, as I go about the state and, and I invite uh, other elected uh, personnel to come to these type of events, uh, this is an opportunity for you to get to know them. Uh, look them in the eye, shake, shake their hand, ask, ask about their home and where they represent, and, uh, and tell them about uh, where you're from and what you do and how we can work together to make this a better region and a better state. So, uh, as you see, Dwayne Burns, he's going to be elected. Uh, he represents the Burleson area. Uh, he'll be sworn in, in in January, but you need to to tell Dwayne about the important issues that are affecting you and your families and your business uh, so that Dwayne, when he goes down, uh, you see, Dwayne, Dwayne has been a politician. He had to be a politician to get elected. But in January, he's going to be something else. He's going to be a statesman. 
somebody <coughs> that now tries to get things done. He's a problem solver. Uh, and uh, Dwayne's one of those guys that's going to go down there and, and along with the other uh, uh, newly elected representatives, and hopefully they won't be politicians. Uh, they'll be governors. They'll be some folks that uh, want to get some results and, and, and make a positive change for this state. And Joy Davis uh, with him. Uh, Representative John Frulo, love him. John, you, there you are in the back. Okay, take a look at you. You can see John in the back there. Stand up, John. Oh. <laughs> Is Representative Ken King here yet? I think he was coming in later today. Uh, Susan King, are you here yet? No. From Abilene, okay. Rep I did see Representative Elect Brooks Landgraf from Odessa <coughs> Brooks. Brooks, well, he was here. Uh, we'll, we'll get him, we'll call her here in a little bit and come back. Representative uh, Lyle Larson, he's probably not here yet this morning. Uh, Brian Lewis, that gummit. <laughs> Late sleepers, I guess. Um, Andy Murr, I know Andy's here. Andy, there you are. Uh, Representative John Otto. John Otto in the back there. Thanks, John, for coming. Representative Charles Perry. Charles, you here yet? Uh, Rep uh, Chairman uh, and Representative Larry Phillips. Okay, I guess they're going to be here a little bit later. Rep I know Representative John Randy's here. John, there you are in the back. Stand up, John. Okay. Uh, Representative-elect John Ray. There you are, John. And uh, I don't think John Zarwas is here just yet. But but thanks again for being here. We've got a great lineup. Um, I'm going to tell you a little uh, story about uh, God and the devil. We're going to have a baseball game. And so God looks down at the devil and he says, Well, you know I've got all the best players and coaches up here. But the devil looks up at God and says, yeah, but I've got all the umpires down here. <laughs> and so I kind of think that West Texas is a little bit like heaven. And uh, we, you're going to hear today a lot of good players and a lot of good coaches. Uh, but you're also going to hear from some umps uh, who are from places like Austin and, and Washington. See, who resemble a little bit like that, that <laughs> hell portion time to time. But they are umpire. They're calling the balls and strikes. You're playing the game. You're playing the game. You're at the plate. You're trying to hit it out of the park. You're trying to make a, a bunt single to make a living. Uh, but we're calling the balls and strikes. And so it's important that, that each of you communicate with your elected representative in order to inform them of the challenges and the pressures and the issues that are facing your, your business so that we can, and other umpires can, know how to call those balls and strikes and how to provide the rules that allow you to play the game uh, better and more successful. So this is a great opportunity. Thank you to, uh, for being a part of it. This is my 10th year to be a part of this, and it has grown dramatically every year, and I want to thank each one of you. Brooks, I see you came in in the back. Brooks Landgraf, wait for the folks. Okay. Uh, uh, so anyway, I'm going to, I'm going to begin by introducing uh, Tom Williams, who is a sen senior advisory, environmentally friendly drilling system. Doesn't that sound good? Environmentally friendly drilling system. I like the, all, every word in that, in that, in that phrase. Tom serves as a, uh, for the uh, Environmental Friendly Drilling Program, EFD, an organization he co-founded in 2005 while working as a vice president at Noble Corporation. Uh, the EFD program is managed by HARC. I have no idea what that sounds, what that means, H-A-R-C, Texas A&M and Tom's company, L-E-I-D, L-L-C. He's been in the energy business for over 30 years as an operator and later in his career in the management and commercialization of new energy technologies. He held senior executive positions at the United States Department of Energy and Department of Interior during the Bush administration from 1989 to 1993. Tom has continued to be involved in a variety of organizations and activities developing 
and applying technologies for the oil and gas industry, and research through fostering cooperation between government and private sector. He is well known in the industry and has authored numerous energy publications, <coughs> presentations, and articles, and has served on a number of energy organizations, associations, public and privately held corporations. Will you help me welcome Tom Williams this morning? Thank you. Thanks for having me here. I am uh, I'm not an umpire, by the way. I don't have enough religion to, uh, to qualify for an umpire. <laughs> okay. okay. Are we up? Yes. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. They uh, wanted a speaker this morning that could set the bar real low, and everybody following them would, uh, would, would, be, would be very impressed with the next speaker as it goes through. So. Thanks for starting the bar real low this morning with us. Uh, I uh, was looking through the program this morning to see if all the things in my name were spelled right, and I looked right beyond it, and there's Tommy Williams right below it. I don't know if Tommy's here or not, uh, but he's, uh, he, he's clearly a lot more educated guy than I am, and, and we do partner with Texas A&M, and I'll get a chance to uh, share and see. We may be related. Who knows? Um, I'm a part of, of an organization that I started called Environmentally Friendly Drilling. And uh, the reason that we got the name that we did is because we wanted to show uh, nine years ago that it wasn't an oxymoron that you could do this in an environmentally responsible way. So I'm going to quickly go over uh, a few things that are applicable to West Texas that we're doing. We have a lot of projects we're doing all, all over the all over the country, but uh, we'll focus on the issues relevant to what you guys are doing. <coughs> and, and a lot of the things that you're concerned about in energy is it has to do with water, air, dust, noise, land, all, all the same issues that most other people are. We'll talk about specific to that. And then we have a, a, a program that we're doing with uh, communicating uh, the, uh, uh, and improving the communication. Uh, our program was uh, started in 2005, and uh, we're a very unique organization. I don't know that any organization exists quite like us in that we get money from the federal government, uh, the state government. We are involved with industry, uh, academia, government, and also environmental organizations. And we all come together and work on common, common ground and common causes. And our overall mission is, is really to look at sound science and uh, try to provide uh, factual information and, and let policymakers, such as many of you guys here today, make up your mind based on sound science. This is a list of our sponsors and how we exist as a not-for-profit is we uh, get money from our sponsors and we get money from the government and we get money from a, 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 any way we can to try to uh, do collaborative work. And uh, HARC is the Houston Advanced Research Center. HARC was founded by George Mitchell. For those of you probably who know George Mitchell is, he's the reason that uh, we're all here today. He, he, he's a pioneer for hydraulic fracturing in the Barnett Shell. And he uh, left this organization as a grant to help foster uh, uh, research. My partner, Rich Hout, is, uh, manages that program. And so uh, said, uh, we have a unique program in that we work with a lot of different groups. As you can see, environmental organizations, we work with a lot of uh, uh, corporations, corporations and collaborators, and we have uh, uh, all these companies here that, that, that sponsor. So I'll talk about a couple of them uh, later on. And then we have Alliance members. We, we have 28 universities and four national labs that collaborate on things that we do. And we try to have a regional presence in things that we do. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? And we try to get people. Universities are, are kind of um, uh, siloed. And so the, the, we have a petroleum engineering department in one and a geology group in another and a law school in another. But they all get together and we try to work on things that they, they really are passionate about, which is, which is uh, trying to uh, balance uh, energy development and protecting the environment. This is just a picture of some of the things that we do. And one of the things that, as you'll see, is we, we have some, all this sub. Uh, all this top row here, invasive species, water screening, and so forth. This program is funded because of a former Texas Railroad Commissioner, Elizabeth Ames Jones. She was tenacious as anybody I've ever seen. And when the Coastal Impact Program, which is the federal government through the Department of Energy, funded the state of Texas and the General Land Office who manages this program, she insisted 
then it have an element of technology. And so we uh, were a recipient of that, those funds. And Elizabeth uh, was very passionate that she wanted to make sure that things that were not only around the coast, but they were applicable to the rest of the state. We have about 15 projects, and they're fantastic projects, and they really help companies do a better job of managing the land. So invasive species, water screening kits, fugitive emissions, all these things are projects that we're doing that's funded through the Coastal Impact Program through a variety of different contractors that we do. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a website later on, but any of the, all of our sponsors are very uh, uh, adept to go into the, our website and, uh, and, and, and take advantage of this information that we, that we publish. Uh, livestock impact, stray gas, and so forth, these are all funded from the Coastal Impact Program. We have a program that's funded by an organization called REPC. REPC is funded through the Department of Energy. It's called Rep Research Partnership to Rescue Energy for America. We have a lot of acronyms in our business. Um, REPC funds a, a very broad amount of research. Our uh, research is um, based on a uh, focus on all kinds of the shell plates in the country. And so the uh, shell plates that we're in that shows here and the types of things that we do. But everything is, has a synergistic uh, appeal to the, the other shell plates as well. So we learn a lot from one shell play and, and, and from the other. This is about a $20 million program that we're, that we're, we're doing. Uh, innovations, uh, th that's what uh, our organization is about. And uh, what we do with our um, operator sponsors is we look for ways to reduce the environmental impact because they know that if you reduce the risk and you do a good job and you're a steward, you're going to make money. And uh, we, as environmentally friendly drilling as a not-for-profit, are not in the business of making money. Uh, we're in the business of, of fostering uh, research and somebody's got to make money and somebody's got to save money and our operators really understand that as well. So, by, by the way, I, I see in the back of the room she snuck in here, I came uh, with a, my driver. And if you've heard the old joke that if you have a really tough question, just ask my driver. Well, my driver's back in the back room. Gail, she's also my chief financial officer, and she's also my lovely bride. So I'm really glad to have my chief financial officer here. If there's anybody that could attest to the fact that we're not in the business of making money, it is my chief financial <laughs> officer. So one of the areas that I, I, I told you I was going to talk about is water. Water is the most precious commodity that we have. And we, our goal is to, uh, is to have a beneficial use of non-potable water for oil and gas operations. You guys know the amount of uh, water that it takes to do hydraulic fracturing. You know that there's an effort going on to do uh, recycle and reuse. Uh, but our program looks at how you can do this thing in a, 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 a way to do analysis, to encourage the use of reuse and recycle of water, and try to use non-potable instead of fresh water to do it. So our uh, program, our water program, is led by Texas A&M uh, GPRI program. We have a, a remote analytical lab. We go around the country. It's in the, it's in the Permian Basin today. And we do side-by-side -side comparison of effective ways to, to treat water, to recycle water, to reuse water. And if we, every well and every play has a unique aspect about it, and certain technologies are applicable in one area, and they may not be in the other, and we believe in the fact that all the rising tide uh, raises all boats, and so we really try to help everybody improve the way that they do business. Um, I, let me back up real quick when we talk about innovations. Uh, our sponsors uh, that are involved in some of the water treatment, and I'll, I'll just mention a couple of them because they're here, uh, Apache and Pioneer, these guys are leaders and they understand about why they should reduce risk and why they should do the right thing and why they should go around, uh, beyond uh, the, the regulations to comply. Both of those companies are very active in water rec recycling and reuse. I sat by a gentleman last night from EQT. They're not a they're not one of our sponsors, but they're an outstanding company. They just drilled the first couple of wells uh, in the Permian Basin, and uh, these guys in the Marcel Shell recycle. They're closed loop drilling, recycle 90% of their water, 
outstanding. They're going to be a great citizen here, and we really admire companies like that that go well beyond uh, beyond the uh, beyond the regulations to do the right thing. So uh, there's our there's our remote lab, and it has all kinds of widgets in there, and uh, gas chromatographs, and all kinds of plug and play technologies to be able to do the analysis on site. And we'll haul this out to different places and do on site because if you take a sample and you don't do analysis on site, by the time you get it back to where it is, it's not it's not the same thing. The, 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 the bacteria de denigrates the, the sample, so we do a lot of on-site work. And we've, what we've done is we've, we've really made a significant impact in showing that you can recycle and reuse water. And uh, we also measure the overall benefits of, of doing this thing, and we try to, uh, to promote this to the regulators and to our, to our operator sponsors. So when people go out and do sampling, they have their own way to do sampling, and there's no standards out there. There's the American Petroleum Institute, and it takes about 20 years to come up with standards. So we decided that we needed to come up and develop our own. So we went out and we recruited uh, federal and state regulators, and we recruited operators, and we recruited environmental organizations. We want to come together and agree on certain standards of the way that you would uh, measure air, that you would measure uh, produced water, that lab that I was telling you about, and, and to, to, to also measure stray gas. And these guys come up with a consensus. This is the way we're going to sample. This is the way we're going to do analysis. And whether it's right or not, it's going to be dead gum close, and it's going to be consistent. And that way, when, you re when we report information, you're not getting a lot of darts thrown at it from environmental organizations that their only mission is to shut us down. And so whether it's uh, reports from EPA, which sometimes we <coughs> hold a lot of question to, and or from some of the other uh, more radical environmental groups. And Environmental Defense Fund, by the way, is not one of them. They're, 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 they're good guys and they're our partners. But there are some out there that really try to stretch the truth a little bit. <coughs> and we try to make sure that our standards are there and, and that they're so. We have a big group going on this thing. It's open to anybody that wants to participate, and if your company or your organization wants to be involved in this thing, look me up, and we'll, we'd be glad to we'd be glad to cooperate on on our analytical program. This is very important. <clears throat> this is the most important slide I have. We uh, started work in the Eagleford, and what we found is that one of the challenges of reuse and recycle water, and particularly makeup of 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 uh, brackish water which you didn't know where it was. You didn't know the permeability. You didn't know the quality of the water. So we hired the Bureau of Economic Geology of, of Texas to do a study and to look at where the water was, where the sources were, and how we could put this thing in a GIS format that, our, that everybody could use. And we put it out there. You can pull it off our website right now. And if you want to build on this database, you can. And as a result, if you're looking for where you should drill your well to to in brackish water instead of fresh water, which we try to encourage you to do, this helps you tell where you do it. This does not exist in the Permian Basin. We put together a proposal with the Bureau of Economic Geology to the Department of Energy, and it was rejected. But I am, uh, um, I am convinced that if the state or the state in conjunction with other organizations could do such a study, it would have a profound impact on uh, reducing the, impact, the the use of fresh water and encourage the use of brackish water. If we could couple this with our recycle and reuse, we're, we're all way ahead. Uh, so this is a, it, and we're not going to have a, all the information that we have. We just went there, but once we have the baseline, we have it in GIS, it can continue to be uploaded. So I, I, I'd really like to discuss how this could be carried forward, so it'll have a big impact. We have a, an initiative with. Uh, I'll, I'll called Power by Natural Gas. And uh, I'll tell you what, I, I really salute uh, Commissioner Porter, what he's trying to do and get the state of Texas in a leadership position on using natural gas. And his summit, I'm sure he's going to talk about it later on. Well, we looked at use of natural gas and what kind of benefits it's going to have on the industry. And, and this is particularly on air emissions. So we are looking at a variety of different things. We're looking at uh, monetizing flare gas. Uh, we're looking at using natural gas as a, a power. Uh, we look at solutions that you could uh, use biofuel and dual fuel with diesel engines. And we have done a number of air emission studies as well on site and really look at 
are there things that we could do to improve the way that we could reduce air emissions and also increase the way that we're using natural gas? So I'll go through a couple of them real quickly. Uh, one, one, of the, one of the initiatives we have is to reduce flare gas. Why would you want to uh, flare gas if you can monetize it? Well, one of the reasons is there's a number of small independents out there, and they don't have the technology to really understand what technologies work and what doesn't. So we partnered with a group called Petroleum Technology Transfer Council. It actually started when I was Department of Energy in, in uh, 1990. And this group uh, networks with all, uh, put on workshops, and they network with all the independents around the country. And so we're working on a, a national program to reduce flaring. And once we come up with some technologies, in fact, we, uh, uh, we're going to go out and do some field demonstrations with uh, HESS on, uh, on one unique uh, 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 technology this next month. We'll demonstrate them, we'll put them up on a website, we'll connect who, who wants to use and who wants to, to uh, benefit from these things and let people exchange information. So that's our, that's our long-term goal and we're going to be working at that over the, the next our overall power by natural gas slide. And uh, you know a few years ago uh, when uh, uh, we realized that we needed to recycle and reuse water, there was a new company that sprung up every day and they had a black box and it was the best thing since sliced bread and nobody knew if it worked or not. And so all of a sudden everybody was so confused about what technologies they wanted to use for water. Well, we said this is getting ready to happen the same thing with using natural gas. So we went out and we looked at companies that were leaders, Apache's a leader in using natural gas, and we looked at the engine manufacturers and we looked at a lot of other organizations and said can we come up with some way that we could promote this thing, but really a factual basis and show what works and what doesn't, what's the benefits for it. So that's our overall program. And we publish a lot of white papers. We, pub we do a lot of work. We're out. We actually spent two weeks at one of the largest service companies doing tailpipe emissions uh, on using different blends of natural gas and how they're going to perform. So we're, we're very, very active in this program. So one of the things that we're doing is to look at emissions control technologies. And uh, this could be different blends and different engine performances and so forth. And so we've got, we go out in the field and we do a lot of things to really help industry uh, increase their use of natural gas. And you know, a lot of the engines that they're converting to biofuels uh, were made to use diesel and now we're putting natural gas in it and there's some advantages, but there's also some disadvantages to uh, from, from a mission standpoint, but the engine manufacturers are catching up very quickly and they're going to get it and we want to help them get it and we want to understand what the, what, the, uh, what the types of gas and what the types of engine configuration should be. Uh, we also have, like I said, we have an air emissions assessment for natural gas powered rigs. We've actually gone out in the field, we, we, do, it in the, we do it in the lab and then we go out in the field and we see what types of air emissions we're really getting, how much a redu reduction in emission standards we are from NOx to SOx. Uh, to CO2 and then we're reporting that information out so the folks will understand what it is. We work with an organization called the uh, Alamo area of, of, of county officials and they're really concerned because as you guys know San Antonio is this close to going non-attainment and they want to look at every way possible that we can reduce the greenhouse gas and the ozone levels so that we don't have to go into non-attainment and so we look at the, the easy things that we can address and this is definitely one of the things that we can address to do to reduce emissions. <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is another one of my favorite acronyms, LUCID, and it's Land Use Site Selection Information Tool. If you said that four times, you'd get it all wrong, you'd get it backwards. And so what this, this is the coolest technology. This is a way that you can use GIS information to figure out where to site wells where you should drill wells, where you should site roads. If you're getting ready to drill a well and you want to get close to infrastructure for power, for example, if you're using your flare gas to do that, this is going to tell you where to do it. Where to avoid a wetland, where to, where to use, what, what, what's your 100-year flood? It's just like this, it can tell you this. So we found an initiative that the Department of Energy funded at the University of Arkansas, and it was kind of floundering because universities are really good at starting things, but they're not really good at at uh, finishing them. So we found a commercial vendor that does this for the pipeline industry. We got them started. We just got this thing started very uh, not too long ago. And we got a steering committee. We have steering committees from operators and from all types of groups. We have steering committees from regulators. This is going to do a tremendous job of expediting the permitting process. And as you guys read, particularly on federal lands, it takes 330 days on average to get a permit on BLM land. Well, that's, that's outrageous in this tool. We'll hold them accountable, but this will speed it up. Uh, 
Commissioner, we would love to have the Texas Railroad Commissioner Commission on our steering committee. We do have a lot of other states, and so we'll talk about that later on, but this would be a tremendous value for you operators and everybody else. Uh, on this project, this is, this is going to help rapidly minimize the environmental impacts. It's going to be a decision tool. Uh, a lot of companies, they use a, they use a, um, a, a service company, a consultant, they have their GIS guys, they have their environmental guys, they're all working on permits, they're all doing site selection, then their geologist says, we want to drill here. Well, all these people have to go back and forth. In one site, this is a collaborative effort, you can tell where you should put your rope, where you should put your well. All the things to do in a very rapid way and how you can do all this and have the least amount of environmental uh, impact. So this is, this is going to really help in the decision-making process. Again, we're, we're open. We, if, 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 you, if your company would like to be involved in a steering committee, we, we'd, we'd love to have you uh, as, this thing, as this thing gets. We hope to have it a prototype for the Eagleford uh, within the end of the year, and we'll hope to have it nationwide pretty soon. We have a scorecard. My business partner, uh, Rich Hout, uh, started the Green Building Council in Houston a few years ago, and as you know, when you go into the city and you see a green building council and you have a rating on it, you say, oh, okay, well, this is environmentally responsible uh, building, and they've done certain things to reduce the impact. Well, we said, why can't we do this for the oil and gas industry? So uh, six years ago, we started a scorecard, and we decided that we would use the same type of premise that the lead green building council did for, for scoring things. So we Side well, let's just do for the drilling part of it. So air, water, site, waste management. They all get, uh, they all get points. And so this is a, show you the next slide here. So this is, this is a, it's a, certain, it's a voluntary program. And some companies are using it today when they just want to assess how they're doing, how they're performing. If they buy another company, they want to make sure that the same types of environmental performances are done there. If they go out and they try to talk to a, a, a landowner and they try to get a lease or they try to talk to the state about it, they can say, look, we have gone through the scorecard process. This is a transparent way that we can show that we're environmentally responsible and this is how we scored. And this is the things that we learned out of it. It's a very thick document and it helps people understand the process. It's a very transparent way to do it. So we've got this going where our sponsors are using it right now. It's, it's, it's web-based and uh, eventually we'll, uh, we'll, 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 we'll exp expand the use of it uh, later on. We, we're, uh, we're actually doing tests in the field in about two weeks. This is a program that is uh, applicable to all semi-arid regions. This is a program that was started by the University of Colorado School of Law. It's a best managed practices program. And this thing gets uh, uh, 9,000 unique hits a month. It's absolutely amazing. And so what this does is it, give, it develops best managed practices. This, goes, this includes regulations, but it goes way beyond this thing. So how is a company doing certain practices to improve their performance? And the backup documents, the, uh, the, the, the papers, the documents, the field tests, and so forth, are all there. I find myself sometimes doing a Google search to look for something that takes me back to this website. It's absolutely amazing the data that it has, but it, is, it was specifically designed for the Rocky Mountain region, but except for West Texas, it's very applicable. It's a tremendous amount of information. One of the things that we also learned as we were doing this thing is there was no good way to do comparative law studies. And so we've got a, an effort right now on comparative law. So, so any state can say, what state uh, requires baseline testing for water? And what are the requirements for it? And what states don't? And how do you do it? Just like this, you can find it out. So it's very easy to search. So we find a lot of policymakers are, are, um, are using this tool to help make decisions about how, how things are done and the impact of them. <clears throat> you all guys know frack focus? This is the most important site for letting people know when you do a hydraulic fracturing in a well, what goes in it. It's a tremendous amount of information for uh, all companies that report what goes in it, what comes out, and all the information around it. So we uh, developed a tutorial so that dummies like me can fill it out. And, and people like me can understand what to use on it. So we've got an easy to use guide that we develop for it. We try to promote everybody to use it. Some states require it, some states don't. But most operators use it regardless of where the state's being done. I know EQT and Apache and, and Pioneer all, all, all do on their ever well regardless of whether it's required or not. Uh, so this is also a good information. So if you're trying to get some information on hydraulic fracturing or what's being done or where it is and so forth, 
go to this website. It's just, it's just a terrific amount of information. It was uh, started by the Groundwater Protection Council and the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission. So we started a virtual site. So for people that have never been out to an oil and gas site before, they can pull up this uh, web link, or you can go to a few places that we have a kiosk, and you can tour a rig, and you can talk to Ralph and Rhonda Roughneck, and they'll give you a tour, and they'll show you what it looked like before and what's green today, and how you can navigate around and see the things. And really, it's a, it's a good information tool. We think it's great for um, um, uh, for college kids, for high school kids to get them engaged. We're actually going to put it in the high school in, in Harris County and uh, college students, but we also find that a lot of the oil and gas companies' administrative staffs, uh, we get hits from the United States Congress staffers all the time. It's amazing. And so these people can tour this thing around. It's really easy to use gaming technology. If you're under 40, you don't have to, to tour. You know what buttons to push. So we're also developing another virtual site on hydraulic fracturing. It'll be out in about four or five weeks. And then we're going to do well pad and gas processes as well. And when you, sir, okay, I'm, I'm about to wrap up, thanks. And so we're, these virtual sites, you can go to our website if, you're, if you have a, a, a fast enough connection and you can tour around on it. If you want to have it in your company, uh, just let me know and we'll send it to you and let you use it, let you, let you use it in your, in your office or however you want to use, use the site. Uh, again, thanks to the CF program, they decided what can you do to improve the environmental culture of the oil and gas industry. And so uh, my partner Rich Hout and I teamed up with a guy by the name of uh, Greg Anderson who wrote a, a, a book called Safety 24-7. It's being used by a lot of oil and gas companies around the country to improve their safety performance. And we wrote a book called Environment 24-7. It's a very fast read and it really helps it's not just oil and gas, it's any industry, and you're really trying to learn how to change your culture in your company. And if you've got your, change, your culture changed in safety, this is an easy step forward, and this is a book to be able to do that with. So, I don't have hardly time to go fishing, do I? I've been writing books and, and, and doing all this work, but this is a, really a great pleasure, and we've enjoyed putting this book out in the last couple of months. Uh, public perception studies. We, uh, we don't know how to talk to the industry. We don't know how to talk to the public. So we hired a team of rural sociologists and they've gone out and they've done studies and they really look at public perception and they go back and tell our stakeholders how you can improve your, your performance, how you can do a better job of communicating and really do it on a detailed level, one-on-one -on -one level. So we just, we've done uh, these studies in, in the Marcellus Barnett Rocky Mountain region. We just completed one in the Eagleford, and we're going to have a workshop on in Houston on October the 8th. And this workshop is really going to be all the findings and what we found in, in a communication plan for our stakeholders. So any any you guys would like to participate in this thing, be sure and, and let me know. Um, one of the things that I learned is how bad I'm, I was in a communicator. And if you work, work with a rural sociologist for a certain length of time, you'll, you'll, you'll learn it as well. It's very, it's very, very telling. Uh, so takeaways from my talk. Improving environmental performance is best done uh, in a collaborative way. This is not a competitive advantage on anybody. We can all work together and we can uh, make things happen a lot quicker. Uh, waste management, addressing water issues, natural gas power will have an added positive impact on traffic, noise, and dust. These are the things that people hate the most. And if we can have a good conscientious water plan and a waste management plan, we're not getting so many trucks running up and down the road. So this, 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 is, a good, this is just good policy as well. It's good business. And it, this requires investment in the right tools. Policy folks, the government can't just sit back and hope that it happens. You need to provide some resources in this collaborative effort and make sure that these innovations take place and they take place in a rapid manner. And this has an impact on policy and efficient regulatory systems and it improves communication. So uh, with that, um, I have 30 years in the industry and I never considered myself uh, anything but a, a green guy. And because uh, uh, Kermit and our buds, and we uh, we we uh, we would like to ask questions. I know my time is out, so I'd be glad to answer questions. If you have some real hard questions, ask my driver in the back, and she'll be more than happy to answer them. From this is our contact information as well. I'll get, I have a few business cards, but if anybody else has any questions, uh, let me know.
So with that, like I said, I guess, I, guess, I guess my time is up. So if you have any questions, I'll, I'll be around all day and I'll be glad to answer them. So thanks very much for having me here.